Hey there, glad to see you here. We're going to be shifting our focus in chapter 13 from now on. We've been working on the unit circle and solving trigonometric equations, working with identities, that kind of thing. And now for the rest of the chapter, we're going to be focusing on graphs of circular functions. And you'll understand what I mean by a circular function very soon. In this video, I'm just giving you an introductory to two graphs that you ought to know inside and out. And those graphs are the graphs of the functions y equals sine x and y equals cosine x, which are circular functions, by the way. So we're going to graph those two things, and we're going to determine what are called their amplitude and their period. And so you'll see how it all, all works out as we continue. Now, first, I know the video said we're talking about what are called circular functions. Another word for circular functions that is often used are periodic functions. And I like the weird word periodic functions for a reason. I'll get into that later. Um, but I have an example of a periodic function here. And, well, let me explain to you why it's periodic. What a periodic function is, is a function which repeats a cycle of y values. And let me use a graph to explain what I mean by a, a function that repeats a cycle of y values. What you're going to notice here is that this graph kind of repeats itself if you look in sections. And let me show you the first section I want you to look at. Look within this green box. Alright, now you see how the graph, the y values, it starts at 0, goes to 3, goes back down to 1, goes up to 4, and goes back down to 0. Then, that whole process starts over again. You have 0, you go up to 3, you go down to 1, you go up to 4, you go down to 0 again, up to for it, it just keeps repeating and repeating and repeating. If I were to draw this graph forever, you'd see those same y values appearing over and over again. All right, so any function in which you repeat a cycle of y values, such as this one right here, is called a periodic function. All right, and the reason I like to use the word periodic function here is because if you look at the length of time in some graphs, it's actually time, but if you look at the spread of x values, over which the cycle of y values um, lasts, the length of one cycle is called a period. And one of the things that we talk about then with these periodic or circular functions is what is the length of that period? What's the difference in x values between the beginning and the end of that cycle of y values? And here it turns out that length is 5, right? We're going from negative 5 to 0. That's five units over which the entire cycle occurs. And then over the next five units, the next cycle occurs and so forth. So the period is five. Okay, great. So now you have an idea of what a periodic function is. Now, let's shift our focus to the two functions that we are going to be working with in this video. Y equals sine x and y equals cosine x in that order. Let's look at y equals sine x first. Now, I also want to talk about why it's called a circular function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the unit circle to help us make the graph of y equals sine x and then y equals cosine x. And here's what's going to happen. Whenever we're working with y equals sine x or y equals cosine x, you have an input and an output into your function, right? And what the input is always going to be is an angle measure. And that could be in degrees or radians, depending on the problem. In this case, I'm going to be looking at the radian values. As you can tell from my number line right here, where I don't have anything in degrees, although these input values are angles, right? I have radian measures for the angles on my input axis. And then the output is simply just the sine of those angle measures, or in the next function, the cosine of those angle measures. Now, remember whenever we're looking at the values of the signs of certain angle measures on the unit circle that's given to us by the y coordinates. All right, now what you're going to notice here is that the y coordinates or the sine values on the unit circle repeat themselves. You start when the angle measure is zero, you start with the sine that's equal to zero. And then you eventually work your way up and work your way up and you work your way up until it gets as high as positive 1. Then it works its way down again, down again, back to 0. And even further down, all the way down to negative 1. Before returning again to 0. 
and starting the whole cycle over. Now what I'd like to do is choose a few of those values and put them on the graph right here that we're going to be working with rather than taking every single point from the unit circle and putting it over here. I would like you to check out the graph in your textbook for y equals sine x where it will actually take every sine value here and show you where it goes on the graph. But in practice, whenever I'm graphing a trig function like this, what I always do is I try to divide the cycle into fourths. Now, notice that as far as angle measures go, in going around the unit circle, in radians, you go from zero all the way around to two pi, don't you? And you can say by the time you get to pi over two, you've gone one fourth of the way through the cycle. When you get to pi, you've gone one half of the way through the cycle. Then here you, at 3 pi over 2, you've gone 3 fourths of the way through the cycle. And by the time you get to 2 pi, you've gone all the way through one cycle of y values. All right. And so I like to use those quarters kind of as the, um, what's the best word, the landmarks for the graph that I'm trying to make. Okay. So let's take a radian measure and put this, it, it together with its sine value. All right. Starting with the sine of 0 is 0. And then by the time we get one-fourth of the way through our cycle, we get as high as positive 1 for the sine value. When the, when the angle x is pi over 2, you get positive 1 for your x value. Now notice I changed the intervals here, so positive 1 actually is right there. And then we're going to continue. In the next quarter of the cycle, we're going to get down to 0. And then one more quarter cycle, or three quarters through the way, we get a sign that's equal to negative one whenever theta is three pi, or whenever x is three pi over two. And then by the time x is two pi, we've gotten back to zero for our y value. Now here's what the shape of the graph of y equals sine x is going to appear as. All right, you start off with a sign of 0, and you slowly increase and increase until it gets to 1. Then you start decreasing and go through 0 all the way past until the sign becomes negative 1. Then it picks up again until it goes back to 0. That right there that I graphed is exactly one cycle of the graph of y equals sine x. Now I'm going to put that portion in a green box, but then I'm going to continue the pattern. But that's one cycle of the values that you get for y equals sine x. Now, as soon as we get to 2 pi, the values start repeating, don't they? As soon as you get to 5 pi over 2, you're all the way back up to 1. Then you go around until you're at 3 pi and you're back at 0, and so forth. Then you would get down to negative 1, then you get back up to 0, then up to positive 1, 0, negative 1. You get the idea. So here's a little bit of an extension of that graph. It continues in the exact same pattern over and over and over again. And it does it going both ways. And when I say go both ways, as x approaches infinity, that pattern continues. And as you get into negative values of x, that same pattern continues, right? If I was at zero and I went into negative angle measures, well, a fourth of the way around the circle, the sign becomes negative one. Then, then by the time you go halfway around to negative pi, then you've, you're back to the sign being zero. And we could continue that pattern forever, but that's, that'll be enough for us to get the idea right here. So this is an example of a periodic or a circular function. And as I said, it's a graph that you need to know kind of inside and out. And if you know your unit circle, it makes complete sense, this graph. Now, I could have done this in degrees as well, where I would have said it at the sine of 0 degrees is 0, the sine of 90 degrees is 1, the sine of 180 degrees is 0, and so forth. Now, a couple key features here. I said that a periodic function or circular function has a period, and the period is the length of time, so to speak, or the range of values before the y coordinates start repeating. And for us, you go all the way from 0 to 2 pi before they start repeating. So that means the period is 2 pi. All right, a period is the length of one cycle. And then the other term I want you to get familiar with is something called amplitude. Let me write that. Any of you that have ever um, studied waves of any kind, whether it's sound waves or others, you're familiar with this term amplitude. 
And what the amplitude does is it tells you how far does the Y values, how far do they vary from their central value. Now the central Y value here would be zero because it goes up as high as positive one and down as low as negative one, but its central value is zero. Well, the fact that it gets one higher than that and one lower than that tells you that the amplitude is one. And here's where the amplitude actually falls. All right, we'll talk much more about that later on, but basically it's a measure of how high or low the graph goes and it's half the distance from the top of the graph or from the maximum value to the minimum value. Okay, amplitude equals one. Let's go ahead and do the same kind of thing, but with the graph of y equals sine x. And you're gonna notice that these are almost exactly the same graph with one major difference. And the major difference is the starting point. Now we're looking at the blue coordinates whenever we're trying to find out what the cosine of zero or pi over two or pi r, right? Cosine of the x coordinates on the unit circle, not on this graph here. Now, just like with the sine values, the smallest cosine that you can get is negative 1, and the largest cosine of any angle that you can get is positive 1, and you keep getting, you know, going from 1 to 0 to negative 1 to 0, back to 1, and all the way around again. The difference here is that this time you kind of start at the maximum value, don't you? Whenever your angle is 0 radians, cosine is at its highest value. So, rather than starting at the point zero, 0, like you did with y equals sine x, the graph of cosine actually starts with the point zero, 1. All right? And then once you go a quarter of the way through the cycle and get to pi over 2 radians, cosine is 0. By the time you've gone halfway around the circle to pi radians, your cosine is negative 1. And then you get back to 3 pi over 2, cosine is 0 again. And... Once you've made it all the way on a 2 pi, you start over at your maximum value of 1. So here's the pattern for cosine. And that is one cycle of the cosine graph. And then just as with the sine graph, the pattern continues. Um, when you go past 2 pi and get to 5 of pi over 2, you're back to 0 for a cosine. And then whenever you get to 3 pi, cosine is back to negative 1 and so on. And then let's talk about some of the negative values, as, well, the values for negative angle measures. If we started at zero radians and went back to negative pi over two, we would get to negative one. And then if we went past negative pi over two all the way to negative pi, we'd get back to the cosine being zero, and so on. Oops, I did that wrong, excuse me. Had sine values in my head for a moment. When you get to negative pi over 2, the cosine is 0. And then when you get to negative pi, the cosine is negative 1. There we go. That looks a lot better. So y equals cosine x is also periodic. The period is 2 pi, just as it was for y equals sine x. Because it goes from 0 to 2 pi before the values start repeating themselves, the y values. And the amplitude is 1 because you can see from the central value zero, you go up as high as positive one, you go as low as negative one, so you never get further than one away from the center. Very good. Now the last thing I'd like to do with this video is just look at those graphs side by side so you can see how similar they are and so we can discuss the differences a little bit more.